Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Neil Silgi for the course Ancient History, History of the Ancient Near East, and Ancient Greece. This is week three, and the unit that we'll be talking about in this lecture is the Mycenaean Civilization. As with Minoans, so with Mycenaean. We have to remember that these are just labels of convenience. This was a pure polity situation. That is, you had a number of communities that were organized along the same lines, engaged in competition and emulation of each other, sharing certain cultural values, and engaged in some kind of trade. As we look at the site of Mycenae itself, one of the things that stands out is the fact that it is on the top of a hill and it's a fairly steep hill. The Mycenaean sites share a general predilection or preference for a location that can be easily defended, a location that has access to ample fresh water. Remember, water is the lifeblood of civilization. So that is a prerequisite. The the Mycenaeans, um, uh, Mycenae itself, for example, has not one, but two natural springs that supply it. Now, Mycenaean Greece and the Mycenaean civilization uh, is really the last phase of the Bronze Age ancient Greece. Uh, it spans from the period of around 1600 BCE to, through to about 1100 BCE. So this is roughly the same time period as uh, the New Kingdom in Egypt. And it represents the first real advanced civilization in mainland Greece. Among the centers of power that emerged, the most notable were those of Pylos uh, in Midia, in the Peloponnese, and uh, things like Thebes, uh, Athens, and the prominent site of Mycenae. Of course, that's what the Mycenaean civilization is named after. Now, the Mycenaean Greeks introduced several innovations into engineering and architecture, as well as military infrastructure. Uh, they seem to have traded across the Mediterranean, and so that really was the core of the Mycenaean e economy. Now, if you remember from our previous lecture, there was a, a syllabic script known as Linear B, and this was the language that was less popular in Minos and the Minoan civilization. And this seems to be the primary language for the Mycenaean civilization. Uh, and it's really the first written records that we have of the Greek language, although it is a very archaic, kind of shorthand, simplified form of uh, Greek. As far as the religion goes, uh, we see several of the deities that are part of the Olympic pantheon uh, being mentioned within uh, the Mycenaean civilization. Now, Mycenaean Greece perished uh, during the collapse of the, the bronze, late Bronze Age in the Eastern Mediterranean. And this is followed by the so-called Greek Dark Ages. And in a few weeks, we'll be talking a little bit about the Greek Dark Ages. And then there was an emergence slowly uh, with archaic Greece later on. Now, there's various theories and ideas proposed for the end of this civilization, among them something known as the Dorian Invasion, or activities connected with a group of sea peoples. And there's additional theories, such as natural disasters, uh, climactic changes. Uh, really, the, the Mycenaean period became um, a stuff of, of legend. 
for most of us. Of course, we, we know of the Iliad and the Odyssey from Homer. That is set in Mycenaean civilization. So we have this mythology and the Trojan uh, epic cycle as part of that. Now, on Crete, so on the mainland, we have a charismatic archaeologist, and this kind of really reveals for us how we discovered the Mycenaean civilization. Um, if you remember, we talked a little bit about Arthur Evans and how he was influenced by someone by the name of Heinrich Schliemann. Well, now we really get to look at Heinrich Schliemann. He was a very charismatic ar archaeologist whose name will be forever linked with sites like the city of Troy. Um, Heinrich Schliemann was a German born in 1822 and he made his fortune being a very successful international businessman. He traveled quite widely. Uh, he traveled across Russia and, and even over to the United States and he knew a number of languages. And then he decided in his middle ages to devote his life to archaeology and to use his considerable fortune to discover something of the mythology, um, the stories of him uh, hearkening back to when he was a child and his father reading the stories of Homer to him. And it was part of his lifelong dream to discover Troy. Whether that's true or not, we're not sure. Uh, in 1865, uh, there was an archaeologist by the name of Frank Calvert who was excavating tr trenches uh, a place called Hisarlik, and he found enough evidence to convince himself that he'd found uh, the site of Troy. And in August of 1868, uh, Calvert invited Schliemann to dinner to see his collection. And at that dinner, he recognized that Schliemann had the money uh, and the desire to fund a dig at Hisarlik, uh, something that Calvert simply could not do. Um, Calvert wanted to go into partnership with Schliemann. Uh, Schliemann returned to Paris and he thought about it and really started to uh, study extensively the literature about Troy and about Mycenae. And he even wrote a book about his uh, developing his, his knowledge about Troy and trying to decide whether or not investing in Hisarlik made sense. Now, in 1870, Schliemann began excavations at Hisarlik under the permit of Frank Calvert. Now here's the thing, Frank Calvert is the one doing the work, but Schliemann is the one that is continually taking the credit. So never in any of Schliemann's writings does he ever admit that Calvert even had anything to do with this, rather just simply that Schliemann was the one that had the idea and that Calvert simply agreed with him about the location of Homer's Troy. So public thought that Schliemann is the one that discovered Troy. Truthfully, it was Frank Calvert. But Schliemann was paying the bills, so no one was going to argue. He nonetheless uh, set about trying to define what Homeric reality might have been like trying to locate the events of the Iliad and the Odyssey in the real world. And he went first to Troy, and he found a site in the northwest corner of Turkey. And as he began to dig there um, with Calvert, they discovered Troy. And they found this enormous treasure, which he called... Priam's treasure. 
uh, and this is the name of the king of Troy in the Iliad. And here you see, uh, in this picture, you see Schliemann's wife, Sophia, wearing some of the jewelry that he found at the site. And this was just absolutely, people went wild over this, and uh, the media just ate this stuff up. Um, of the excavations at Troy, Schliemann uh, became really an international celebrity. You can see in the in the top picture there, uh, there's Schliemann standing by the uh, Lion's Gate. He's the one standing on the top on the right. And then if you see in the window on the upper left, that is um, uh, Calvert over there. Now you see him, he's perched there on the top of one of these great walls known as the Lion's Gate. And in 1874, Schliemann again, at least allegedly, claiming to be the guiding voice, claiming to be guided by the voice of Homer, he began an excavation at Mycenae. Now, one of the things that you probably have noticed already is how different the construction is here from that at Kenosis. Here we have clearly uh, a city built for defense. Uh, these massive stones are so big that they came to be called the Cyclopean stones. They're part of the wall at Mycenae. Uh, because it was thought, uh, th this comes out of, of the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey of the the giant cyclops, as it, it was said here, uh, at least part. It, Schliemann w was happy to engage in the legends, and so it's said that the creature, only a creature as big as a cyclops with their massive muscles, would be able to carve out and move such stones. Now, as Schneeman began his excavations, he found some interesting things. Uh, he found a grave circle, which was quite unusual within the walls of the city. Usually cemeteries are outside of the city. And these graves had a number of distinctive features. Uh, they are marked with upright slabs, the tombstones, gravestones, called stele. Um, here's some examples of them in the, in the slide here. And they had carvings on them in high relief. And this one is showing some kind of battle scene, it seems, with a warrior in a chariot about to spear another warrior standing in the ground. The whole content of Mycenaean art is much more aggressive than you see uh, in Minoan art. Minoan art is very peaceful and tranquil, and my my scene in my the art at Mycenae uh, tended to have this very strong war theme, very much like what you have in the th themes of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, these stele were meant to mark out graves. And some people have, have even called them imaginary doors to the underworld, the boundary marker between the world of the living and the world of the dead. Now, these gravestones are not like gravestones today. Um, there's no names on these things. But it does seem that the elite here didn't have to leave uh, an identification. Something of their story was enough for, for people to remember them. Some other things that were found, probably the most important thing that was found, uh, were funeral masks, such as the one that we have here made out of gold. And this mask is called the Mask of A. Agamemnon. Uh, the famous Greek hero who uh, figures so largely in the Iliad. 
So as with Arthur Evans, however, there's some questions about Schliemann. There's questions about whether or not he, the word that was used is reconstituted, or some people even said out and out fraudulently had this made. And the reason that they say that is that it's a very elegant upcurled mustache uh, on this mask, which seems to be the same general style that was used in the late 1800s. And so some people question that. Um, what is evident, though, is that gold was in abundance in Mycenae. And that there was a, an enormous amount of treasure. And that the Mycenaean lords supported a high degree of craftsmanship. Uh, there are tons of examples. Here's just some, some simple examples from the Archaeological Museum in Athens. People used these as personal adornment. There was a lot of personal adornment, a lot of use of gold within Mycenae. And it seems to have been a very important part of trade within the whole region to circulate these kinds of luxury goods among the members of the upper class in Greece. Um, now, this is a picture uh, where we get a, an image of the social stratification of Mycenae. There seems to have been a warrior elite as part of this social pyramid. And the elites tend to engage in rivalry with other elites that live nearby. And there did seem to be some international trade that went on here. Um, not only in terms of technology and not only in terms of gold, but in terms of literacy. Uh, now, we know this because the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, uh, Mycenaeans were both literate and that we see this use of Linear B in some of the communications. Um, now, for example, we have this very mundane clay tablet written in Linear B that um, just has records of the storehouse contents that we have. Um, linear B texts were mostly used for administrative nature. There were forms of lists of goods, they were for inventory, there were statements of delivery, records of commercial transactions. Uh, the tablets detail that there was manufacturing that went on. Uh, particularly of woolen and linen fabrics and of perfume oils. So that was part of the economy that went on here as well. And within this, there was also um, mentions of chariots and armor and weapons and soldiers getting ready for campaigns. Um, what we have in the picture to the right here is something that is very interesting. It is a picture of a helmet that was used in the uh, by the Mycenaean warriors, and it's made out of um, tusks. So, essentially here we have... Um, something that was actually mentioned in uh, so, so, so these boar tusk helmets were things that were mentioned. Homer describes this kind of helmet. And so there's all of these small details that we see that Homer had information about even though he lived hundreds and hundreds of years after uh, what went on in Troy and in the Mycenaean era. So there does seem to be a good deal of 
evidence for some kind of source material that Homer was working with. As I mentioned, the Mycenaean civilization underwent a relatively sudden, massive systemic collapse somewhere between 1200 and 1150 BCE. Um, in one citadel after another, it seems that there was burning and there was pillaging and there was destruction. And the inhabitants were either killed or dispersed. Um, whatever the case, uh, they were defeated and for a period of several hundred years, this whole civilization goes dark. We call this the Dark Ages basically because we don't have any examples of artifacts in the history. Now, obviously, the people didn't all die because uh, this civilization does rise again later in the archaic, with the archaic Greeks, but we don't have any information really to speak of about the Dark Ages, but we'll speak a, a little bit more about that in later lectures. And with that, we will end this lecture on the Mycenaean civilization.